Thank you very much for inviting me to this Congress and for the opportunity, the first opportunity for me to visit this beautiful city. My talk today is to inspire you to think about global mental health as something that isn't just about the other, about another part of the world, but about every single society in the world. Because as far as mental health is concerned, every country, in my view, is a developing country. And in this respect, mental health is the unique discipline of global health in which the global is local. Friends, I want to start by something which all of us here in this room are well aware of. And that is that over the last 50 or 60 years, the clinical mental health disciplines that I think most of us in this room represent have developed some of the most transformative, effective interventions in medicine. These include drugs, psychological therapies, and social interventions that we know can transform the lives of people affected by mental health problems. This evidence is so strong that very rarely does the World Health Organization produce treatment guidelines. Very rarely. Yet, one of the few occasions in which it produced treatment guidelines was in our field, in the field of mental, neurological, and substance use disorders, as captured very nicely in this 100-page set of guidelines for the treatment of eight different varieties of mental, neurological, and substance use disorders. Yet, despite this very important scientific foundation, what is the reality of mental health care across the world? This is a busy slide, but it's an important one. In this slide, the countries of the world have been organized according to how rich they are. Italy would be a high-income country. The country that I live mostly in, India, is a lower middle-income country. And for each set of countries, you see four different bars. I want you to just focus on two of them. The second bar here shows you the amount of money the government spends per person on mental health care. And the other bar I want you to look at is this bar here, which is the proportion of people with depression in that country who received minimum adequate care. If we look at India as an exa example of a lower middle income country, you will see that only about a dollar per person is spent each year on mental health care. And not surprisingly, the proportion of people with depression who receive minimal adequate care is only about 4%. Let me turn this another way around. 95% of people in countries like India, and it's even worse in Africa, do not receive even minimum care for depression. Let's look at America, another country in which I now spend a lot of time. The amount of money being spent on mental health care is 10 times more. Sorry, 50 times more. 50 times more. But the proportion of people who receive care for depression is only six or seven times more. Even in the world's richest country, which spends an astronomical amount compared to a developing country on mental health care, the vast majority of people do not receive minimum adequate care. Let us pause and think about this for a moment. For me, the takeaway message for this is that simply throwing more money at the problem, simply throwing more professionals at the problem, is not the solution. We have to start thinking and acting on an alternative way of delivering mental health care if we are going to get beyond this very low level of coverage. 
And when mental health care is delivered in many parts of the world that I work in, this is what it looks like. I was talking to the next speaker about the word psychiatry being often associated with negative images. Well, it isn't surprising if this is what psychiatry looks like for most parts of the world outside the Western world. I know that actually <clears throat> in the Western world this is also what it looked like, but maybe 100 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, this is what mental health care continues to look like for about half of the world's population even today. This is why my colleague Arthur Kleinman has often described the practice of psychiatry across the world as a failure of humanity. Because for a moment, imagine if this was the care that people with HIV or TB received. In fact, people with HIV did receive this kind of care 20 years ago. And there has been a transformation in the global response to HIV precisely because of the human rights abuses. <clears throat> Sadly, much less evidence of that kind of progress in the field that we work in. Let us not for a moment think that these horrific conditions of care only apply to poor countries. In the richest country of the world that now I also live in, this shocking statistic, which I actually got from the National Advocacy Center, reminded me that in many rich countries of the world, prisons and indeed the streets become the place where people with mental illness find themselves. Now, if we know that there are very effective interventions for mental disorders, why is it that we have systematically failed, no matter how rich the country is, to deliver them to the people who could benefit? Well, there are many different reasons, and I will spend quite a bit of time in my talk referring to those reasons. But first, I want to demonstrate to you that we have spent a lot of time thinking about the barriers to the delivery of mental health care. And a few years ago, I led a group of 55 psychiatrists and psychologists from around the world on behalf of the World Bank to produce this volume that sought to describe the effective delivery methods for all the interventions that MHGAP, the World Health Organization Initiative, has recommended. And for those of you who are interested to look at a summary, if you don't want to read the whole book, which is available free online, um, you can just download the free summary paper that was published in The Lancet last year. In short, this pyramid of care, which I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with, because it is the classic World Health Organization pyramid that describes how mental health care should be delivered, with a focus not just on the tip of the pyramid, which is where many of us spend most of our time in psychiatric facilities, but at the base of the pyramid. This is the single most important message of the Disease Control Priorities Program, is that we need to invest in innovations that seek to improve access to care, access to quality care, at the base of the pyramid. Not just through primary care, which of course is something many of us will be familiar with, but actually care right down into the community. That is how we will be able to reduce this enormous gap of unmet need at a very efficient and economic way. Now, over the last decade, the chairperson of this session described the field of global mental health. This field has primarily sought to address these sorts of barriers to care through innovative ways of delivering evidence-based interventions at the base of the pyramid, at the community level and at the primary care level. Over the last couple of years, we've looked systematically at the evidence base. And as you can see from this slide, 
There are actually many more systematic reviews, by the way. These are just four that I have personally been involved with. That the evidence base is huge. In fact, if I had to count the number of individual randomized controlled trials that have tried to deliver mental health interventions in places where there are almost no mental health professionals, the total exceeds now 70 randomized controlled trials from about 40 countries in the world, 40 developing countries. This makes this evidence base perhaps one of the largest in psychiatry, and indeed it is the largest in global health, if you leave aside HIV AIDS. This is a monumental evidence base that demonstrates a variety of strategies that have been used to deliver mental health care interventions, especially psychosocial interventions, at the base of the pyramid, at the base, the foundation of the mental health care system. And I want to actually draw your attention to this very interesting systematic review, because this specifically looked at interventions in rich countries. The first three are mainly, are entirely in low and middle income countries, but this last one actually is from high income countries. And here's the interesting thing about high income countries, particularly in the US. The ideas that I'm about to share with you are very old. They've just been rediscovered in the developing world. And it is perhaps time to take them back to the developed world. And there's some exciting stuff happening in the developed world that I'll turn to at the end of my talk. So, what have these in innovations taught us? First of all, I want to start with some universal findings. When I was a trainee psychiatrist, I was taught that cultural factors were so important that actually we could not take any knowledge from the West to other parts of the world. And I remember being so heavily influenced by this thinking that in 1993, when I left England to go to Zimbabwe, I was armed with only one book in my bag. Those were the days before email. I had only one book in my bag, and that was a book written by my mentor, Arthur Kleinman. It was called Patients and Healers in the Context of Culture. It's a classic book in anthropology, in medical anthropology. And I was so heavily influenced by that thinking and by my training in anthropology that I believed that depression, for example, was a complete Western condition. 25 years later, I stand here and having not only studied depression in many different parts of the world, firsthand as a physician and as a researcher, and having read the work of people who live and work within their own cultures, I'm here to tell you that, in fact, we need to stop thinking that cultural factors are so profoundly important that psychological pain is not experienced in every human being across the world. I often use um, this analogy that if you pinch someone in any part of the world, they will feel pain. And in much the same way, if you experience loss, defeat, violence, trauma, you will feel pain no matter where you are, and the pain actually looks very similar no matter where you are. I think this is a very important finding from this very large body of knowledge generated not by northern psychiatrists working in the south, but by southern psychiatrists who have spent their whole lives in the south. It confirms that the knowledge not only of the nature of mental health problems, but therefore the psychological frameworks through which you can help people recover can translate across cultural boundaries. In fact, where there are differences, it's not between cultures, it's within societies. One of the most remarkable things that I have found about the work that we do in developing countries is that the innovations that I will now describe very shortly are the same that have been used to reach out to poor people or minorities in rich countries. In other words, if I have to improve quality of mental health care in Africa or Asia, the things I do look exactly the same as 
people do in America to reach out to black people or to Latino people. It isn't so much the culture that differentiates the way you deliver care, but social class. If you're poor, if you're marginalized, if you live at the fringes of society, then you have to think differently about how you deliver mental health. The content of mental health care remains the same, but the delivery mechanism must be adapted to address social class barriers. So, what are the barriers? And I'm going to summarize the three most important barriers that I take away from this very large body of implementation science. The first is the barrier of not having enough skilled providers. Notice I have not used the word psychiatrist. This is because there are almost no psychiatrists in most parts of the world. To give you one example, there are more psychiatrists in New York City than they are in the whole continent of Africa. So, let us for a moment not believe that psychiatrists are going to be able to reach 7 billion people. So, we need to be thinking of alternative human resources, but they must be skilled to provide mental health care. That's a very important barrier. The second is the barrier of access, and this has a lot to do with social class that I mentioned earlier. But let us not forget there's also a demand side barrier. And I think this is very important in rich countries. There are many psychiatrists and psychologists in New York City, and yet, as I will talk to you about later, New York City is reimagining its mental health care system. This is not because there aren't enough of us. This is because also what we have to offer is not always acceptable to the people who can benefit from them. So we have to think differently about improving the acceptability of our interventions. So how have the innovators around the world that I described, we reviewed, been addressing these barriers? Well, let's turn to the first of the barriers. The lack of skilled providers. This is something many of you will be now familiar with. It is a very well-established strategy for delivering particularly psychosocial therapies, is the use of non-specialist providers, non-professionals. And the range is quite enormous. From community health workers who are now the frontline workforce in Asia and Africa. In India, for example, we now have one million community health workers and about to be doubled to two million. And they're being redeployed from their original mandate of maternal and child health care to now mental health care and non-communicable diseases as the burden of disease begins to shift. But not just community health workers who are formal members of the workforce, but also a r range of other less formal providers, such as, for example, paraprofessionals, peers, church leaders, and so on. A key element of all the innovations is that the training isn't just simply come for a workshop and learn something, but it is actually systematically evaluated on the basis of well-defined competencies to deliver the psychological and social interventions. The second important element is systematic supervision. And increasingly, the availability of digital platforms is transforming our opportunities to supervise frontline workers. But even more exciting is the idea that frontline workers can supervise each other. This I was inspired by one of the world's biggest online learning platforms. It's called Coursera. What Coursera showed is that when students mark each other's grades, uh, assignments, the grade that they give is identical to that of the teachers. And the reason, of course, is that if you're grading your fellow student, you want to be honest because they will be grading your assignment too. And then finally, this is a, a relatively new idea in which you basically aim to break down very complex psychological and social interventions like CBT into very specific elements like behavioral activation and exposure, and you train specifically to learn these techniques rather than the whole package, because the whole package is much more complicated to learn and deliver. The second barrier is lack of access. Not surprisingly, 
The innovation is don't deliver the intervention where you are, deliver the intervention where your patient is. And for that, it means that we have to again learn from other fields of global health like HIV and TB. One of the most exciting things about the TB revolution is that treatment is delivered at home. The TB frontline worker comes on a cycle, he comes home, he gives you the medicine, and he watches you take it. This is called DOTS, and this is what is transforming TB care and control in the developing world. This is exactly what global mental health innovators are doing, delivering interventions at home. Why? Because very often, for example, my patients are mothers with three children at home, a sick grandfather to look, at, look after, and cannot come to the clinic six times a month to come for a therapy session. So therefore, I will go to her and deliver the therapy to her. And that is also helpful for her in terms of acceptability. And of course, digital delivery, uh, uh, we heard a little bit in the earlier session about the power of technology, and I endorse that. I think digital delivery, especially for self-care with appropriate guidance, is another very evidence-based approach for psychological therapies. And the third important barrier is the lack of acceptability. And one of the most interesting things I have found in my own work, but I've also seen other people do that, is to start moving away from psychiatric diagnostic labels, in fact not start, to completely abandon psychiatric diagnostic labels, and instead work with patient-defined needs and desires. For example, my problem is that I have very poor sleep because my husband is unemployed. Let us deal with those problems that you have identified rather than for me to tell you you have a mental illness label and treat you with that new diagnostic box. A very important aspect of a lot of these interventions is the engagement of personal and community resources. People are not helpless out there waiting for us to come and save them. People already have many resources and a key part of these community-based interventions is to mobilize those resources. In every part of the world that I work in, there are very few social workers. And so the idea that the mental health provider can deal only with the clinical phenomena in exclusion of the social determinants is very artificial. I can't be telling people, go see a social worker for your domestic violence because there is no social worker to deal with your domestic violence. Your provider needs to be able to find some way of addressing social determinants as well. And of course, the common elements approach I mentioned is easier for patients to learn. It's easier if I tell you there is a technique, for example, like activation, that will help you cope with your depressive symptoms and recover, rather than me saying there are five different things you have to learn over 16 weeks in order for you to recover. And all of this is delivered in a collaborative care model in which the frontline worker, which in some countries like the US is called the case manager, this particular diagram actually comes from the University of Washington's team care program, which is now reaching seven northwest states in the US to provide collaborative care to people with depression and anxiety in routine care settings, and also being extended to the care of psychosis. And as you can see, the key element here is the patient's at the center of it all, and then you've got three sets of providers with this case manager acting as the glue, the link between these other providers. This, by the way, is also very evidence-based. Collaborative care has now been evaluated in more than 80 randomized control trials. In fact, it is the best demonstrated model of care for chronic diseases of which, of course, mental health problems is a very important example. Now, for those of you who think that this means we don't need specialists, that is not the case at all. In fact, all of these experiments and innovations rely on the full and complete support of psychiatrists and psychologists. And here I've described to you the key roles that mental health professionals play in this program. And if there's one thing I would like to leave this audience with is the idea that we have to embrace as a professional community these innovations if we genuinely wish to change access to care and improve quality of care at the population level. We have to play a role, and this is the role I play, and I have played for the last 20 years. This is exactly what I do. 
But increasingly, this is also what my fellow practitioners who are in the non-academic fields are doing as psychiatrists and psychologists in many parts of the world. This is also, uh, this is a plug, I have to say, for my book, which, in fact, I, the first edition of which I, I, I wrote in 2003, uh, and the second edition will be released next week, building on this very large body of evidence. When I wrote the first edition in 2003, not a single one of the trials I've mentioned to you actually had been published. Um, and now you can see more than 70 trials in the last decade or so, uh, and I think, the, therefore, the, the knowledge that we have on how we can deliver mental health care is now very strongly founded on science. But beyond clinical manuals, I think it's important to recognize how exciting this evidence is in transforming mental health within the global development agenda. In my country, in India, for example, India has passed the most revolutionary mental health care legislation and policy. Last year, the mental health care bill was passed in parliament. India's parliament may be a bit like Italy's parliament, where no one agrees on anything. But they all agreed incredibly on mental health care. I was astonished, because I heard the parliamentary debates. They went on for seven hours. And one after another of the legislators of the Indian parliament got up and gave passionate speeches about mental illness in their own families. And I have to tell you, I was absolutely left speechless. They completely agreed on a law that is revolutionary that entitles Indians with mental illness to publicly funded care in the community. I don't even think the parliamentarians have any idea what that means in terms of cost, but they have passed that bill and now it is law. The World Health Organization plan, the, the, the Mental Health Action Plan, it has, speaks the same language. And last year in April, the president of the World Bank, Jim Kim, and the president of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan, joined hands together at a summit in the World Bank to call mental health not a global health priority, but a global development priority. And the bank now insists that every country loan it gives must include mental health, and it is built on the foundation of the base of the pyramid. But perhaps most excitingly, the Sustainable Development Goals, which is the UN's development agenda, has now acknowledged the importance of mental health in three of its targets. Importantly, I've underlined that they talk not only of health coverage, but of promotion and prevention. I want to summarize how we can achieve this aspiration. Firstly, we need to think of brief community and primary care based psychosocial interventions delivered by frontline workers and self-care as the foundation of a mental health care system. We need to think of simplified common elements based psychosocial interventions which target specific mediators that are increasingly shown to be based on our understanding of neural circuitry. Digital delivery is an important platform that we must embrace where possible, and collaborative care is the delivery mechanism through which we can coordinate the delivery from the specialist in the hospital to the home. And step care approaches, of course, which are very uh, much aligned with collaborative care, you deliver what intervention according to the need of the individual. I have added this because while my lecture has focused entirely on treatment, I think we need to recognize within the SDG agenda that there is also great importance being placed on prevention, particularly through targeting the early life course risk factors. The moral imperative, the SDG um, uh, uh, slogan is leave no one behind, and the moral imperative in the mental health field, of course, is that we mustn't leave anyone behind who has a mental health problem, and we know exactly how we can do that. I want to end, as I mentioned to you, by saying that these are ideas that are not only profoundly important to the developing world, but also the developed world. Last Friday, I was in New York City. Um, this is the mayor's uh, wife, the first lady as, she, as she's called in New York City, where there was a one-day event hosted by the mayor and the event was titled Tar Shifting for New York City. I had never heard or imagined the word tar shifting being used in the world's richest city. But there she was and she was surrounded by more than 400 registered participants drawn from all these different sections of New York City, all united under one roof to call for better mental health care. How? 
through building these roles, for example, the police, as being skill providers for mental health care at the base of the pyramid, with full support of the city government and of the psychiatrists who work in the public sector. This is star shifting at scale. I myself have been fortunate to receive a gift from a foundation in the US to start implementing the work that I did in India and in Africa in Boston, one of the world's best cities in terms of you know, the hospitals they have. I think this is disruptive, of course. And I hope very much that we will take the frontline worker idea out of the developing world and put it in the developed world. And this is precisely the initiative that I hope to launch uh, on April the 6th in Harvard University. The kind of ideas that I've shared with you deserve to become part of teaching curricula, of innovation and implementation in all parts of the world. So I want to end by inviting you all to join us at the launch of this initiative at the university on April the 6th. Thank you very much.